spilled out now. That's where, that's where you find them. Not the pain clinics anymore so much, although they still got a few of them because the pain doctors are recalcitrant, recalcitrant. So, you know, how do we deal with that? Is that does that happen at the state level? Does it happen at the federal level? How do, how do we it's my get profession. more treatment options available? Oh, for drug addicts? Yes. Um, we're struggling with that right now. And, and how do you move people into treatment too? Because you can't force anybody into treatment. And by the way, they do poorly when you force them into treatment. Well, yeah, I mean, they have to want to be there, right. and they, you know, listen. I mean, that's that's the that's the, uh, the that was the, the answer for the, me anyway. The like, other right. thing is they they're now bringing meth on top of the opiates, which is a horrible combination. So we're seeing a lot of that. It is, um, yeah. I mean, it's wiping out mm -hmm. tons and tons of people. Mm -hmm. But if you obviously you can't force anyone to get sober, and I know that. I mean, you can. It's not that you can't. It's that they just don't do as well. But we're in such desperate straits that. Um, Maybe we need to really create motivation somehow, right? Like really hold a, a strong legal stick over their head. But as we approach a, uh, an election year, mm -hmm. right, um, and and no doubt candidates will be talking about this epidemic. What what is is there is there a federal solution to this other than? Uh, you have to funding. Change, you have to change. There's tons of funding. There's funding. Have, they, they don't. Not, only ten percent of drug addicts get treatment. Okay, not because they don't have access. So recently, they did a study and they talked to that ninety percent. Why aren't you getting treatment? Eighty percent of the ninety percent said, "Why? I don't want treatment. Fuck you." Right. Which is precisely what I would have said. Also, right. you right. know. In fact, and so you have to create some motivation somehow, or they're going to die. Right. And I would argue that we have to have very strong legal sticks and carrots in, in place. I, I suspect we do. When I, when I got – when one of the doctor's offices eventually caught on and, and this incredibly lovely um, office manager said, hey, listen, we think you have a problem and we can't continue to treat you, I, I, I was so offended – I put on such a show of uh, of outrage that you would even suggest I have a problem. So they're not used to dealing with that. To me, I would have just gone, "Oh my god, you're so funny! <laughs> Give me a break!" <laughs> you know. And but they get panicky and think they made a mistake and never don't won't confront the next guy. Right. Right. And listen, and to their credit, they cut me off. They did, but it's but not the I way to deal. You don't cut you off. Let's bring you in and have you treated. You're not a bad patient. They right. did it. He right. strung you out. It's uh, – and uh, yeah. And so uh, – but the, the – you know, I could flip open the yellow pages. That happened back then. And there was a whole section, sure. a whole page of – You go from one to the next. Of pain doctors. Yep. And I knew the names of the pain doctors in the tri-state area like some people know – the like starting lineups of their hometown baseball teams. I knew who was where, who was affiliated with which hospital, who was likely to prescribe. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it became my occupation. Mm -hmm. It really did. I get it. Uh, and and um, did you keep your job through all this? I did keep my job mm -hmm. through all this, which is just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. And um, and I had it until they closed details in 2015. And those – and I'll tell you this. Uh, the pills didn't make me more productive. They what? didn't. They didn't they give didn't. me more energy. They didn't make me more creative. My ideas were not better. Or were, it, it, <clears throat> my life improved dramatically. My relationships with people improved dramatically. I was present in my life really probably, if I'm being honest, for the first time, mm -hmm. Right. And, did you have some trauma as a kid or something? You know, I I I, I didn't. I I think um, I I never felt, and this is a you hear this commonly amongst addicts, alcoholics. Um, I never felt like I fit in. I felt like everybody had been given a manual, boys, girls, men, women, on how to go through life, and when they got to me, they had run out of manuals. <laughs> And I just was never comfortable in my own skin, and I never felt like one of the guys yeah. ever. Yeah. And so I escaped through magic. I was really into magic. Actually, magic factors heavily in my story. David Copperfield factors heavily in my story. Um, so I would like hide in, in your my recovery. 
Yes. So wow. I, 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 I grew up um, just being a total magic nerd. Did right? you go visit him in Vegas in that storefront? With the yeah, museum? I've been there. <laughs> I've been there. And so I would watch his specials. He had this like CB, uh, CBS special every year that I would tape on VHS. And um, I would watch it over and over and over again, trying to figure out how he did this, that, and the other thing. I eventually had a chance to interview him uh, when I was working for W Magazine and then meet him again when I was at Details and we developed a friendship. Mm. And when my wife, threw, pregnant wife, threw me out uh, of the house, uh, when I came back to New York – I went to David Copperfield mm. and I said, I need a place to stay. And D- I'm, an, I'm an addict and David was incredibly generous and, nice. and kind. And so I got sober really in his, his house in New York um, and, uh, and, and that was that, you know. So, um, but I, so, that, so no, no trauma, but I just never felt like I fit in. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, you know, my brother was – the star athlete, the star student, was incredibly popular with with girls. My closest friend, the same thing. I always felt like just this. I was the 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 buddy. I was the you know. I was Cameron from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I was like every character ever played by Anthony Michael Hall. I was <laughs> the guy that just that the girls would 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 complain to uh, about their problems with the guys and hug me before going off with the other guy. Right. I, and, and so I just, you know, f- isolated and, and um, found my way into this really extraordinary career, which mm-hmm. I'm grateful for, um, but really uh, had a mask on and, um, you know, hid, you know, in a bottle of pills. And it's a pretty common, you know. I had some. There are some uncommon elements to my story. Yeah, but it's it's it is a very. It, it is common. a story of our time for it, sure. It really is. It uh, really you is. Think about Prince and anybody else you can think of that died of exactly what you went through. They just yes, died of it. I know. And it was always the same: opiate benzo, opiate benzo, opiate benzo. Always. I mean, it's extraordinary, yeah. you know. And so the benzos are still being overprescribed, still. So what what gives? You know, like they don't understand addiction. My my peers do not understand addiction. They don't get it. You have to see it a lot, and I really understand it. And and one of the and one of the key core problems is my peers are offended by the idea when I approach them on this notion that they shouldn't believe their patients. How I have a. Tr- the foundation of my relationship is trust. Right. I have to trust my patients. I, no, you have to figure out what's going on right. and give do the right thing for your patient. They're lying all the time. And addicts lie all the time. Listen, I mean, Constantly. lying is the number one side effect. If, of, you if know. my patients didn't lie, their diagnosis would be in question. Right. It's like, not an addict if they're not lying to you. I lied uh, my ass off. Yeah. And, 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 and so all the research is built on reporting from the patients. All the addiction research. Yeah. Or unobserved urines. Forget it. Or if they don't show up, well, they're lost to follow up, not they're using. Right. Unbelievable. So all the research is flawed. No one is trained properly in how to actually manage the person. The, the, your buprenorphine prescriber, there's lots of those out there. Yeah. They don't, they don't understand addiction. Uh, you know, I, someone told me uh, very recently that um, throughout the sort of uh, edu- – the, the years of education that it takes to become an MD, so uh, whatever that is, whatever uh, undergraduate courses you're taking. It's 12 years. It's 12 average. years, right? That's a short. That, that with, within that sort of short 12-year period yeah. – there's really only a few hours dedicated to uh, – I'm an addictionologist. The only training I had was we visited an AA meeting, which I didn't understand what was even happening, at a, a so-called rehab unit, which is actually a, a stroke rehab unit 
in uh, Downey. <laughs> okay, so that was the only training, and that's an hour. AA meetings are, are typically we didn't, an we hour. We weren't even there now. We were there half an hour. Okay. That was the, uh, and we talked to an alcoholic maybe for ten minutes. So what's wrong with that picture? And, and by right? the way, the whole time working at a county hospital took care of tons of alcoholics and heroin addicts, and did not address their underlying disease at all. We were just dealing with all the medical problems that they caused. Never dealt with the the underlying condition right. ever. Ever. I think one of – Except one, to tell them to stop using. Right. Yeah, sure. Stop doing <laughs> yeah, this. Yeah. You know, get yourself together. One of the reasons that I, I wanted to write this book was to help in any way that I could with my story to destigmatize. Why don't you go back to the pain doctors that were doing all the prescribing and go, you don't know what addiction is. Right. And I, and I was in your midst for years. I hope you're doing better with it. Yeah. They, I mean, they never learn because no one ever comes back. I eventually called all of them and said – Hey, I'm a drug addict. Don't prescribe to me. Don't prescribe yeah. me any medication. That's different than going back going, listen, I'm here to try to teach you when you don't believe your patient. Right. I lied to you for five years. I'll send them my book, you know, if yeah. nothing else. But it was um, – the hard part for me was uh, was not getting more. You know, mm-hmm. the hard part for me was 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 stopping and, and um, you know, but, but getting them – Listen, there were challenges for sure, but getting them was, uh, you know, was it's certainly at least in New York City back in in the early. Well, most 2000s. people give up and switch to heroin. It's cheaper, yeah, easier. Yeah, it's all over the place. I actually went one night here in L.A. to try to get heroin. Um, I, I've never done heroin, but I tried one night to get it, and uh, went. This was the night that I met the rock star mm. and that limo driver, and we dropped the rock star off behind his gate. And uh, I said to the limo driver, hey, um, the magazine that I work for is doing a story on, you know, well-known celebrities getting drugs. Like, where would they go? Can you show me <laughs> one of these areas? Is there like a skid row? Yeah. Like, or is that like a thing that, that you just hear about? And he took me to some pretty seedy area and I got out of the car and he said, you sure you want to walk around? And and uh, I, I went and um, asked for, for heroin from some guys that, that approached me saying, hey, what's up? Uh, and I was chased away. Either they thought I was a cop oh, or yeah, whatever sure. it was. Uh, I was. I got chased back to the car, and that's when the dr- the limo driver said to me, "Hey, man, what are you looking for?" <laughs> you know. And and initially, I was like, "Dude, just take me to my hotel." And he persisted, and I told him, and he said, "I got you." Mm-hmm. You know. So I I came this close to 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 doing heroin. Crazy. You know. Talk about recovery for the last couple of minutes. Uh, you know, recovery is as much a priority for me now as the drugs were when I was active. Has to be a little more. It, well, yeah, listen, a little more because it, 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 it feels better. It, well, it fair. feels much better. But I, I, I think I, I put as much energy into the recovery uh, as I did into the drugs, and I put a lot of energy into the drugs. Yeah. Um, my my life is radically different now. Uh, I'm a dad. I have three beautiful boys. Mm. Uh, they have only ever known me as a sober man. Uh, which is a, which is a blessing because mm-hmm. I spend a lot of time in meetings. I still go to meetings sometimes three, four times a week, right. um, and you know you hear stories in these meetings of people trying to repair broken relationships with their kids. Um, it is it's heartbreaking. So I, I really that's a blessing for me. Any um, do you, do you, are you sponsoring other people? I am. Yeah. I'm, I'm uh, I have sponsees. Um, I have a sponsor. Uh, I work the steps. That's great. Um, you know, I own my shit. I'm present for my life. Um, and uh, but listen, as they say, like we're not saints, right? Like I can still be irritable. I can still be a dick. And but when I am, I recognize it very quickly. Sometimes immediately, and I immediately apologize. Like, hey, you know what? I'm. I'm sorry I spoke to you that way or like whatever. I'm just having a bad day or whatever it is. I know how to self-diagnose. You're like, hey, why am I – why did I just snap at one of my kids mm-hmm. or or why did I just grow irritable with – with this person or that person, and and you know I own my stuff, you know. So for me, my recovery uh, is is incredibly important. Uh, the meetings are incredibly important. The fellowship of the twelve step program is incredibly important. And now there's evidence that twelve step. Finally, we have evidence basis for twelve step that's as effective or more than any other form of treatment, especially when abstinence is your goal. And abstinence was my goal and remains my goal. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, there's a there's a discernible, very noticeable difference that I can detect within myself, and I suspect others might be able to detect in me mm-hmm. if I miss 
meetings for for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. I just am a little bit more on edge. And it's not that I'm going to reach for a bottle of pills and and, and grab them. You know, it's that could happen. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a daily reprieve. Mm -hmm. But it's just it's it becomes behavioral, uh, behavioral. Mm.